Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us here today. As Ryan said, I'm Amy Royer, Public Health Program Manager for the National Hypertension Control Initiative at the American Heart Association. I am serving our Western region. The AHA, or the NHCI, is funded through the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health and the Health and Resources and Services Administration Bureau of Primary Health Care. As Ryan said, we will send a copy of the recording to all registered emails today. So we are delighted to have you join us today for our fourth National Hypertension Control Initiative Primary Care Association webinar, partnering with health centers to address health disparities and health equity. Next slide, Ryan, please. So today we have a packed agenda with many distinguished guests for uh, guest speakers. To kick us off, the Office of Minority Health will provide an overview of the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare. Next, the California PCA will discuss how they are advancing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion within their association and with community health centers. The South Carolina Primary Health Care Association will then show us how they are utilizing Azara to observe and address health disparities within their state. Last but not least, we will hear from our partners at Unite Us. First and foremost, I want to display that equity is always at the core of what we do here at the American Heart Association. The outer ring of this graphic shows the American Heart Association's work in communities. We reduce risk for women, address community health needs, work to end e-cigarette and tobacco use, provide tools and programs that empower people to lower their blood pressure, we improve nutrition security, and build mental health well-being. A little closer to the center of the circle, you'll see that this work applies to each of our impact areas. We have strategically chosen each of these areas based on science and expertise showing that they are the most effective ways to equitably save and improve lives. Now that we've talked a little bit about the key focus areas at the American Heart Association, let's dive into high blood pressure, which is our key area of importance at the National Hypertension Control Initiative. Nearly half of U.S. adults are living with high blood pressure. High blood pressure hits communities of color and limited resource communities the hardest. And of the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States, heart disease falls at number one, while stroke falls at number five. So that's what brought us to this point, and that is why it's so important that we are all here right now. This, shows, this slide shows the death rates over the last 10 years from cardiovascular disease. The overall decline shows promise, but the disparities in deaths are jarring. Black adults are 32% more likely to die from heart disease than white adults. And while the death rates among other ethnicities are lower, they are not dropping at the same rate. On this slide, you'll see that the story is even worse with stroke. Black adults are 45% more likely to die from stroke than their white counterparts. For Latinos, Native Americans, and Alaska Natives, the decline in death rates is not keeping pace with the decline for white adults. Again, this is why it's so imperative that we ensure all populations receive access to appropriate education and quality care. These statistics paint a bleak picture, but I am confident that the work being done by the National Hypertension Control Initiative and all the efforts being done by our honored guests here today is really helping to take a step in the right direction. So without further delay, I would like to present our first speaker of today. It's Juliet Bui, a public health advisor of the Office of Minority Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Go ahead and take it away, Juliet. Thanks so much, Amy, and hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to join you today on behalf of OMH and to provide this overview of the national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services in health and healthcare or the national class standards. And I hope that the standards and our related resources will be helpful tools for you and for health centers uh, to guide your implementation of class aligned with this strong focus on equity and the great work to eliminate tension related disparities in the communities you serve. Next slide, please. So I want to start first by sharing how OMH defines class and how we talk about the case for class. There are two points in particular I want to highlight about our class definition. Uh, first, how we define class centers the individual and individuals' beliefs, preferences, health literacy levels, um, and their communications needs should really shape how we think about and how we deliver health and healthcare services rather than a one-size-fits-all approach. And second, 
class doesn't just apply to doctors um, in hospitals and clinics and only when you're delivering clinical interventions, but really should be employed by everyone at an organization and by any organization or system that might influence health and well being. Next slide, please. So as I'm sure you know, there's a number of reasons why class is important, and I'll touch on just a couple that you see on this slide. So uh, first, providing class and meeting the needs of the population served contributes to improved access to care and improved quality of care and services. And we see this through a number of outcomes like uh, increased individual and family engagement, improved communication, increased use of services, and increased adherence to treatment. And there's also evidence that uh, using culturally tailored interventions are more effective than those that are developed for a general population. From an operational perspective, class aligns with and supports compliance with policies, legislation, and accreditation. So for instance, class supports compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which includes requirements for providing meaningful language access. And finally, class advances equity. Um, throughout the pandemic, uh, we know that it's clear that some communities are being disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and that the lack of class has played a role in contributing to barriers and poor outcomes. So class is particularly important for health equity, um, both in the context of the pandemic and beyond, especially in light of the barriers that some populations have faced historically. Next slide, please. So to operationalize class, OMH developed the national class standards. There are 15 standards, each of which is an action step that guides professionals and organizations in providing services that are respectful, understandable, effective, and equitable. Uh, we promote collective adoption of all of the 15 standards, and each standard is viewed as an equally important guideline. Uh, they're structured to include a principal standard, which you see on the slide, um, and that principal standard serves as a foundation for all of the other standards, uh, which fall under three themes. Uh, the first theme is governance, leadership, and workforce. And this theme emphasizes that um, implementing class is the responsibility of the entire health system and that it requires the investment, support, and training of all individuals in an organization. The second theme is communication and language assistance. And this encompasses all communication needs and services inclusive of languages other than English, but also sign language, braille, oral interpretation, and written translation. And finally, the third theme is engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability. And this focuses on those supports that are needed for adoption, implementation, and maintenance of culturally and linguistically appropriate policies and services. So you can see that there's attention beyond just language assistance, and really this is a comprehensive approach that takes into account the breadth of actions that are needed to, to really fully provide and sustain class. Next slide, please. I am going to call an audible and skip this slide in the interest of time. Thank you. Uh, so now while the standards provide a blueprint, how they get implemented is going to vary from organization to organization. And they might employ different strategies depending on their size, their mission, uh, the scope and types of services they provide, and of course, the individuals they serve. Um, so this slide shows just a few strategies that organizations can use to implement the strategy, the standards under each theme. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share um, a real world example of how a health center's work reflects implementation of the national class standards. Um, Kokua Kalihi Valley Comprehensive Family Services is an FQHC on the island of Oahu, Hawaii. Um, and I wanna be sure to give credit to KKV for these images and information. Um, as you can see, uh, their mission statement integrates a clear focus on class, um, showing that organizational governance and leadership promotes class. And we'll see how this focus and mission cascades in particular across their COVID-19 response efforts. Next slide, please. So as the... Uh, I think we missed a slide maybe there. Is there a, no? Okay, that's okay. Uh, so the uh, KKB's COVID work was organized around a staffing and response framework that was informed by epidemiology, but in their words was also guided by culture and relationship and the acknowledgement that historical 
and ongoing cultural trauma um, and its repercussions. And this demonstrates an approach that infuses culturally and linguistically appropriate goals and policies throughout planning and operations for the center. Next slide, please. Aha. So as the pandemic began and progressed, KKV used health and social determinants of health data to assess community needs and disparities uh, and to inform their response efforts. So given what the data were telling them about disproportionate impact and needs, they focused their efforts on providing food and service delivery to Pacific Islanders, um, elders, families in public housing, and patients with chronic disease. And they also built a data system so that they could continuously uh, measure progress to inform their efforts. Next slide, please. So they uh, provided outreach uh, services and materials in the languages used by the community, which aligns with um, uh, the uh, principal standard, focused on the provision of care that's respectful of and responsive to individuals, beliefs, practices, and preferences. Next slide, please. So you can see here again, um, again, just uh, further evidence of their focus on um, particularly the standards on the communication and language assistance theme, ensuring that they were providing services and materials um, in the preferred languages of the community. Next slide, please. And finally, it's clear that KKV uh, recruits and supports a culturally and linguistically diverse workforce. Uh, they provide training on culturally and linguistically appropriate practices as well. They have staff that are fluent in 26 Asian and Pacific Islander languages. Uh, they train their bilingual staff to deliver messaging accurately and appropriately. They hire youth and elders in the community and they assess the gifts of their staff and community to match the needs of patients. So hopefully you can see through that example, some of the ways that the class standards could be applied in uh, NHCI, in the delivery of training, in outreach and engagement efforts, um, in the use of data, and as um, strategies and approaches to embed blood pressure monitoring and treatment best practices are developed and implemented. Next slide, please. So now I'd like to share some resources for you to learn more and to hopefully use in your work. Uh, Think Cultural Health is our website that houses resources like guides and e-learning programs uh, to help build capacity around understanding cultural and linguistic competency and implementing the class standards. Next slide. We offer a suite of e-learning programs for a number of types of health professionals. Uh, these e-learning programs are grounded in the national class standards um, and they are interactive, they're self-paced, and are also accredited so users can earn continuing education units. Next slide, please. And finally, we offer resources specifically to support implementation of the national class standards, um, which includes an implementation checklist. We also have a blueprint for advancing class policy and practice and a behavioral health implementation guide, uh, which describe uh, concrete strategies aligned with the standards and also an evaluation toolkit for organizations to assess their implementation of the standards. And that will do it for me. Thank you so much for the time and please feel free to reach out to me if there are any questions uh, or if you'd like to connect about class. And I look forward to further discussion at the close of this webinar. Thank you so much, Juliet, for your presentation. And I wanted to let everyone know that Juliet will be providing a deeper dive into this topic on April 26th at our next NHCI Health Center focused webinar. The webinar is Race, Ethnicity, Data, Collection, and Class Standards. So the registration link will be dropped into the chat if you'd like to register for that next event. So next, we would like to introduce our next speakers with the California Primary Care Association. We have Buddy Orange, Senior Vice President of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and then Ali Bundes, Director, Deputy Director of Quality Assurance. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you. If you can advance to the next slide, please. And the one after that. So what I'm going to do is talk about um, what we've done, our journey to become an anti-racist organization and where we began. So in the winter of 2017, they hired a um, senior VP of JEDI, that's me, to really mitigate some pain points and also to, to kind of like 
build out and standardize a way that we can um, create internal capacity for, for CPCA. So what we began to do to, to become an anti-racist organization, initially focusing on JEDI, is we had an organization-wide implicit bias training. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we were able to create a diversity policy that was vetted by everyone that included a North Star. And our North Star is that we want to represent the population of California. So we want our internal workforce to represent the, the population of California. The other thing we want to do is we wanted to increase our diversity by changing our hiring practices and our recruitment practices so that they could become much more diverse. And over the course of time from say 2015 to 2022, we become a much more diverse organization. Um, and we continue to do some trainings around cultural competencies. And then in 2020, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, the Black Lives Matter movement started. And we realized that we couldn't just be a DEI organization. We really needed to transition to become an anti-racist organization. So what does that mean? Um, a number of things. Um, number one is we needed to pivot, as I said, become an anti-racist organization. And we did a number of things at a number of different levels. Number one is we provided coaching for all, everyone in the organization. We had um, coaching for become better allies um, because we want to center black staff, especially what was happening at that time. We provided coaching for black staff as well and formed a, a black staff affinity group. And we know that in order to become an anti-racist organization, it's not just about creating some kind of statement. We also needed to create competencies. So we've drafted a set of competencies that included growth, inclusion, um, competencies so that we can include that in our professional development and also include that in our advancement practices. Um, we formed an anti-racist work group, which was a group across the organization. Um, and they have been responsible for building out a number of initiatives. We have um, a monthly meeting where we talk about a book, um, where we talk about other things that pertain to anti-racism. Um, we're looking at how we can create our vendor ecosystem so that all of our vendors can be a lot more diverse. Um, we offer, again, professional development. Uh, so we've done all these things. We have an anti-racist statement that includes our values and our practices. And we're looking at ways of how we can make that live in the organization. Um, and also we've had some additional trainings around the history of anti-racism, the history of um, slavery, um, anti-Black racism, and how that all pertains to health inequities and how we can create health, um, health equity. So I wanted to give you a brief, brief overview and now I'm gonna pass it over to, to Ali. Great, thanks buddy. And yeah, you can advance the slide, thanks so much. So a lot of CPCA's internal anti-racism focus, especially that piece about educating staff really translates into the work and the products that we produce for health centers. So staff that create content are really working hard and getting much better at ensuring that our learning objectives include equity considerations and we're focusing on diversifying our subject matter experts and our presenters on the vast array of products that we produce. Um, this box on the right here, this call out box is an example of how we've built JEDI into our training structure and our systems. This language is actually on our website and it's very clearly written on our call for presenters whenever we have a large event. We're also structuring on the back end of our presenter vetting system. So whenever we have a conference and we're trying to outline the agenda, we're structuring it on the back end so that we explicitly ask the reviewers who are staff and also health centers. Um, we ask how this session or these presenters are going to advance JEDI um, and a JEDI focus, which is really important. So also on the screen, you can see that we have a variety of different training modalities. The most common ones are on the slide, um, our standard webinars, webcasts, and podcasts. We also have PLUS programs, which are our cohort style learning programs that are really focused by discipline. Um, I think there's five at the moment. We have like some of the examples are Medical Assistant PLUS, Financial Management PLUS, QI PLUS, and we're really trying to embed JEDI into as a thread that weaves throughout all of these programs as well. So for example, in QI Plus, we have um, a unit that's all about equity considerations in quality improvement. And then throughout the year, we also host five different and distinct conferences, including our annual conference and smaller topic specific conferences like quality and technology, for example. 
And then we do also offer um, content in cohort learning styles and in um, like distinct individual trainings that's explicitly about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if you go to the next slide, I'll preview one of them and then I'll hand it back to Buddy to talk about our leadership equity program. But I wanted to share a bit about the empathy effect, which is a training that I'm a facilitator for along with some colleagues of ours um, at the regional associations of California throughout the state. As you know, California is huge. We actually have four, uh, four, 14 uh, distinct regional consortia that work in a, one county or in counties that are grouped together. Um, and really this training, the empathy effect we started it when health centers were struggling to implement the SDOH screening tool. You probably know it, it's called PREPARE. Um, and we heard from health centers that they really needed tools to have very difficult and tough conversations um, around SDOH needs. And that there was a need in diving a little deeper to counter some of the internalized biases and judgments that staff may bring to their patient encounters. So the empathy effect is a four hour in-person training that we heavily modified throughout the pandemic. This started way before the pandemic, but we've since modified um, to be approachable, so not four hours and not in person, um, but still be very impactful for the audience. And really the whole premise of the training, um, which you can learn more about, I think I included, right. So at the bottom, there's a, a link to the Empathy Effect Countering Bias to Improve Health Outcomes um, via the Institute for Healthcare Communications. You can go there, learn more about it, but really the premise of the training is to share just how, um, harmful judgment can be to patient care, and conversely, how impactful empathy can be to our patient relationships. Um, and then we also, in the course of the training, ask folks to identify what gets in the way of conveying empathy, like our own beliefs and biases, and we share with them some strategies to counter those beliefs and biases. And that's it for me. I wanna hand it back to Buddy, though, to share more about um, the leadership equity program that he has created. occupational hazard of being on mute. So I'm super excited about the leadership equity program and talk about it. I do wanna mention one thing that I forgot um, in our internal work that each of our departments are also centering um, anti-racism and how, uh, what that looks like in terms of the services and the programs and the technical assistance that they provide so that, so that we're really centering this work and it's emerging from what we do. So the leadership equity program, it is, a, it is actually happening right now. We have a cohort of about 19 folks. Um, some people may be familiar with um, Clinical Leadership Institute. It was a program in California um, that lasted for 10 years, a very prestigious program that ended. And we at the California Primary Care Association had decided that we needed to fill that void and continue to um, provide some kind of um, leadership program um, for, for Californians, for folks who are potentially going into the C-suite. Some of the differences from that program to this program is that we wanted to we wanted to make sure that it was a diverse leadership equity program that was sending more diverse people into the pipeline, um, and also that we want to build capacity for the executives already in leadership. And I'll talk more about that. If you can go to the next slide, please. So. This program is, is unique in that we're focusing on four different um, buckets, I will call them. So everyone in a cohort um, is going to experience uh, a segment around anti-racism and, anti and, and racial equity. Um, that's a core component of the program uh, that all of them are going to experience. The other bucket is leadership development. So in addition to knowing about um, anti-racism, the history of health equity in this country, um, how it presents itself um, presently, we want competent leaders as well, how to lead change, how to lead teams, um, how to lead groups, how to lead departments. So we have that as a bucket as well. Uh, and also because we're focusing on PCAs, I'm sorry, because we're focusing on community health centers, we also wanna make sure that they're competent in health center operations. And, and then the, the last piece for the cohort is that we want our FQHCs to be more place-based. We do a great job of folks entering into um, the community-based um, health centers, um, but, and they get well there, 
and they get treated there, but then they go into communities experiencing inequities, inequities and diabetes and all the stresses of racial trauma and other forms of discrimination, they continue to happen. So it's, it's this cycle of, of not well-being um, because the community is still experiencing these inequities. So another component of the program is community well-being in which the cohort participants are learning how to get proximate in their community and to innovate some place-based practices that they can bring back to their community health center. Next slide, please. Um, this is the capacity building piece. So in addition to the experiences that our cohort participants are going to have, we want to make sure that we were focusing also on building capacity for the organization because we can have a great experience. They have a great um, experience at the leadership equity program. And then they go back to an organization that may be behind them um, where they don't have the same level of understanding anti-racism. They don't have the same level of place-based practices. So we're also doing some capacity building pieces with all of the executives that sponsor these participants um, so that when they go back into the health center, um, there's capacity building for them to do two things. One is um, this capacity for these diverse leaders to advance in the organization. So we're helping them to develop professional development practices. Um, there's also capacity for the organizations to take some of the innovations that they've learned in the program and be able to inculcate, inculcate that in the organization. Um, last but not least, we also wanna make sure that they're able to, to be, be more place-based. So we're hoping that this next generation of leaders will rise up in the organization and help all of the community health centers in California to not only continue to do the excellent service that they provide to patients, um, but that they can also link up with other organizations in the community to be more place-based to also partner in mitigating some of the health disparities there to really create true health equity. Um, next slide, please. So I'll say thank you. And that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much, Ali and Buddy. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, for our next segment, we're going to have Ms. Janice Bostic. She's a women's health informatics analyst at South Carolina Primary Healthcare Association. And she will be joined by Dr. Janiqua Duncan, Chief of Value-Based Care at Care South Carolina Community Health Center. So good morning and good afternoon to others. Again, my name is Johnny Spostick and I am the Women's Health Informatics at the South Carolina Primary Health Care Association. And I'm also co-leading other um, clinical practice transformation initiatives that we have at the PCA at this time. And so uh, like many other PCAs, we are the unified organization of community health centers in South Carolina and our mission is to provide a unified supportive infrastructure, um, one that facilitates um, access to community-based primary, behavioral, um, and any other health care services to our community here in South Carolina. And um, along with a lot of other of the programs and services that are offered, again, clinical practice, transformation, um, legislative and, and advocacy, outreach, enrollment, things such as workforce development, revenue maximization, and more. One of the things that we do pride ourselves in is providing an infrastructure that supports health centers and addressing the ability to meaningfully use um, current or prospective electronic health records. We also pride ourselves in also helping our health centers with the adoption of technology, which enables quality improvement strategies, um, something to help them better facilitate the data-driven um, decision-making um, at their facilities. And so um, we, um, part of our South Carolina control network is our um, Azara drives. And um, Azara is a centralized data reporting 
and analytic software. And so it also helps with simplifying um, mandated reporting for our health centers. And it's a population health management tool that basically acts as an overlay to the different, um, to the health centers electronic health records. We do have health centers with um, multiple health records here in the state, um, but that tool will overlay um, many of them that we know such as um, ECW or Athena um, and others. And so some of the great things that we have um, can report about Azara drives um, are things such as their dashboards, dashboards, which help to provide insights um, and trends when it comes to UDS and HEDIS measures. There is a great referral management program, which helps our health centers close the loop on those referrals that um, may be hanging out there um, and able to see what is left. There is a patient visit planning component, and the purpose of this is to help identify gaps in care um, and so that our cl clinical staff is ready to um, provide the patient with the best care at the day of their visit and beyond. The data is, is validated, and is validated through accurate benchmarking and um, other trends reports that are there. And there is also cohort management. That is another tool um, that is within the Azara Drives program, something else that can assist our health centers with the work that they do. So the National Hypertension Control Initiative, we have eight centers in the South Carolina who do participate and who are able to use the Azara Drive system to help them with um, addressing health disparities. And so, you know, I can talk uh, a lot about what drives does, but I think what better way to highlight the work that's going on here in South Carolina is better um, is for us to hear from a participating health center who actually uses the drives population health tool to address the health disparities. So at this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Janiqua Duncan from Care South. Hi, good afternoon and good morning. Um, so for our health center and using drives, um, particularly with the um, NHCI grant, the way that our team is structured, we have RNs who are providing the remote patient monitoring devices within the offices and they rotate around to enroll patients. And they're using that patient visit planning report that Johnny spoke about to identify who those patients are. And on that report on drives, it also tells what their last blood pressure was and any comorbidities as well as risk factors that they have, whether they're clinical risk factors or social risk factors because we, are, we have implemented the PREPARE survey within our offices. And so they're able to have that quick snapshot um, of the day and the patients on our listing so that they can plan out who they will focus on in terms of trying to enroll them and put, get them into our remote patient monitoring program. In terms of other ways that it helps us, um, like Johnny spoke about, there's an ability to create cohorts and also build registries within the Zara tool. So I have used both of those um, functions for this grant and also other programs. Um, and it allows me to make comparisons. So um, in particular, there was a partnership um, that we still have with the South Carolina Primary Healthcare Association and our uh, DHEC, which is our Department of um, Health and Environmental Control. And it was looking at trying to expand the use of medication therapeutic management and clinical pharmacists and their improvement for blood pressure in particular. And so that, that uh, project wanted to look at a specific group. So we were able to use uh, the functionality within drives to make comparisons. Um, one, to find out which one of our practices would probably benefit the most. And then from there, utilize um, the demographics of that population to see what demographic population might um, benefit most and where the at true disparity was. And so once we found that and we knew what patients to target uh, with the clinical pharmacist, I was able to put those patients within a cohort in Azara. And then once I ran quality metrics and reports, I could pull that cohort out and see how they were doing compared to our gen population. Um, other ways that we've used um, Azara and in, in particular, um, some of the functionality related to health disparities was early on in the COVID um, pandemic, when we were trying to figure out ways to proactively help our patients, 
um, I was able to build some registries which looked at uh, the, the comorbidities that patients had that at the time we felt like were um, risk factors, worsening risk factors, should that patient contract COVID. And so building that registry and, um, and sorting it uh, by race and ethnicity, we had a team who outreached to those patients via telephone and it was really just a checkup. We just wanna see how you're doing, how are things going with this pandemic? Uh, we wanna let you know that we are still here for you. This is how you utilize telemedicine. Do you have all of your medications? What can we do for you? And so we use that as a proactive way to reach out to patients um, to make sure that they were set, that they were settled and were not struggling at home without us and um, early on in the pandemic. And Azara eventually built uh, pre-built registries that with just a couple clicks of the button would do the same thing for us. Um, I'm trying to think, I wrote a, a few notes. I think that's a, probably a good overview. Is there anything else, um, Johnny, that you wanted me to address? No, I think you did a good job, thank you. So we will turn it back over to Amy at this time. Excellent, thank you so much for joining us and giving us that wonderful overview of how your teams are utilizing Asara. Um, next, I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Phil mendez Gipoko. He's going to actually introduce our next uh, guest and our partnership with Unitas. So Phil, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Amy. I appreciate that. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Phil and I'm the Senior Public Health Program Manager for the National Hypertension Control Initiative. The American Heart Association and Unitas have been working closely together build a coordinated care network of health and social care providers that augment the work of local community-based organizations and federally qualified health centers. Our partners in the network are connected through a shared technology platform, Unitas, uh, which enables them to send and receive electronic referrals, address people's social care needs, and improve health across communities. Uh, we'll be working together uh, in the National Hypertension Control Initiatives in over 180 health centers across the country. For now we'll move into our question and answer session. So please type in the Q&A portion. We would love to get your thoughts and feedback. And while we have these wonderful presenters on, um, please type in and we'll, we'll get some responses. Um, I also will uh, bring on our my colleague, Leslie Brown, who is a public health program manager for California. She's been moderating the Q&A. So I'll see, Leslie, do we have any questions coming in? Hi, Amy. Yes, we do have a few questions. Um, the first question was actually um, for Juliet, our first presenter. Um, there's a question on how do we access the program and is there a cost um, of the programs that were shared in her presentation? Thanks for the question and the interest in the Think Cultural Health e-learning program. So you can access them on the Think Cultural Health website, which I believe Lillian helpfully dropped a link in the chat box, um, but uh, the URL is thinkculturalhealth.hhs.gov. They are completely free. So uh, there's no cost associated with taking them. And um, so we invite you to, to register and check out our programs. Leslie, I have a follow up. I think um, she might, uh, jo, jo, Jovelle might have been uh, referring to the, the classes or the leadership training that Buddy was mentioning. And so I wonder, um, Buddy, for those courses, the leadership equity program, um, I know you do them with the C-suite leaders in a cohort based format, and then you also can do CHC capacity uh, building. And so um, kind of a question to that is, is there a cost associated for your CHCs? And then um, is this kind of the kind of training that could be taken by anyone or is it just available to the California uh, CHCs? So I'll go to the last one first. Um, is it just available for the CHCs in California? <clears throat> yes, for now. Um, but the hope is that we'll, we'll be able to expand that nationally over time. Um, this is our first cohort. We have cohort one um, and that ends in November. And so, yes, we do hope to expand it. And I, I will say, I forgot to acknowledge some folks, um, Molina Cares Foundation, they're the ones who have sponsored us 
um, with a significant grant for the program, and it's also a fee for services program. So for the first question, uh, the cost for each CHC or each participant is seven thousand seven hundred dollars, and that includes the the cohort experience, and that also includes the capacity building um, experience for the executives, where they have five sessions of their own, and they each get coached to to build capacity um, on an individual level and on a, on a cohort level. Thank you. I also have a, a follow up for you, buddy. Um, I know you had mentioned some of the place based strategies that you were working with um, those leaderships on. And I wonder if you have any success stories that you've heard based on the training and that cohort working on anything in their local communities. Not yet. The program actually kicked off in March. So that was last month. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so we don't have any, any um, we have anecdotal information about how they're responding so far. Um, but I also want to say that our delivery partners are, are We in the World um, and also uh, Mapu Consulting. So I, I'd be remiss without um, giving them a plug. And uh, Mapu Consulting has helped us with um, building the anti-racist um, capacity and the leadership um, development part. And We in the World has been instrumental in helping with um, the Capstone Project and, uh, and the place-based um, community well-being practices. Excellent. Thank you. Any more questions, Leslie? There was one more um, for the South Carolina PCA. Um, is anyone from the South Carolina uh, PCA using the Azara hypertension report with the map with the map measure, conformatory BP treatment and specifications, et cetera? I can just answer for our centers. We are we are not using that um, functionality in SR for MAP. I recall from um, our previous PCA webinar, I know the Montana PCA had brought up kind of the drives reports for doing the MAP measurements. And so if anyone is interested, I think we have a list of what those reports are called. And so I think um, I don't know how easy it is to add them into your system, but um, at the very least, if you want the names of those, we can let you know and you can work with Azara to get them uploaded into your system. Okay, any other questions coming through? Just one second, I think one. I have a question for Unite Us. Um, so there are a lot of health centers on this call today that are NHCI. And so if they are interested and kind of ready to participate in Unite Us, um, is it time, can they start reaching out to, let's say their public health program manager with the American Heart Association and let them know that they would like to participate? I get Absolutely. some head nods. <laughs> Absolutely. So we are actually planning on sending out um, an invitation for regional information sessions any day now. So we will be reaching out preemptively to do a more in-depth overview of Unite Us, actually show the software, and there will be next steps for how to join included in that email. Um, Shannon and I can put our emails in the chat if you have questions or you're excited, you already want to get started. We're ready to go and would love to start chatting with some of you if you feel the same way. So we can absolutely send our emails out in advance, but keep an eye out for um, emails from our team as well as the larger AAJ team as well. So we can start scheduling and inviting you to information sessions. Excellent. Thank you, Brittany. So stay tuned, health centers. We'll be reaching out soon. No other questions at this time, Amy. Um, there was just one question from Michelle, uh, not a question, but just a comment, Michelle to him wanted to say that she loves the Unitas platform. They're currently using it to send out referrals. Oh, excellent. I know we're so excited for this partnership and to get it rolled out across the country. So I'm happy to hear you, um, health centers out there are utilizing and really like to use it. Oh, we have a comment from Tony Wood. Um, you can have them added for free by entering a ticket. Oh, this is for the Azara Drives Report. So Tony was our presenter at the last um, PCA presentation. So you can have them added for free by entering a ticket to Azara. You'll want to request the MAP measures, so MAP measures, and you will find the following reports. So we have hypertension, medication intensification, um, conformatory repeated blood pressure measurements, and then an average of systolic BP reduction after medication intensification. 
Thank you so much, Tony. That's very helpful. I'm going to drop that in the chat too, just in case um, people don't see it in the uh, Q&A section too. Tony said she couldn't make it today and she's here. <laughs> okay, let's see. I will drop it in the chat. Oh, God, yes, I'm having trouble. <laughs> there we are. Okay. <clears throat> Excellent. Let's see if there's anything else going in. All right. If there are no further questions, um, I'll wrap up. You can still send those in. I know we have a couple minutes, five minutes left. Um, but I really want to thank everyone for joining us here today. If you want to learn more about the National Hypertension Control Initiative, you can email us at nhciheart.org, or you can check out our website, which Lillian will drop in the chat for you to check out. Um, you can also reach out to your local public health program representative. Um, so if they've contacted you or been in touch, um, we're a good resource for you to reach out to. But um, thank you, everyone. And that concludes our webinar for today. We really appreciate your attendance and um, continued partnership on this initiative and working to reduce blood pressure in America.